we should start. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, it's a pleasure to have um, Alexey Pokrovsky to speak today um, on a proof of Ringel's conjecture, a uh, very recent result uh, joined with Richard Montgomery and Benny Sudakov. Uh, if you have any questions during the talk, you can write them in the chat. Um, unless there is something urgent, we will take all the questions to the end. So, um, Alexey, you can start. Um, thank you, Leanne, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. So I want to tell you about joint work with Richard Montgomery and Benny Sudokov. So this will be about, the whole talk will be about a problem called Ringel's conjecture, which is a problem um, from graph decomposition. So the problem here is you want to decompose a complete graph into edge disjoint copies of some fixed tree. So imagine you fix a tree with n edges and you have a complete graph on two n plus one vertices, then Ringel made a conjecture that you can always decompose the edges of the complete graph into copies of the tree. So as an example, here's a four edge tree and a complete graph on two times four plus one, so nine vertices. And here's a way of decomposing it into copies of the tree. So here's one copy of the tree, here's a second one disjoint from the first one, and you can find nine disjoint copies of the tree. So that's an example of what the conjecture says, and he's a, he, the conjecture is you can do this for every tree. Um, how did I find the decomposition in this example? So the way I found it is I found one tree, and then I rotated it nine times to get nine disjoint copies of the tree. So this is an approach towards Ringel's conjecture. This is what's called a cyclic decomposition of the complete graph. And there's a stronger conjecture by Kurtzig that you can always find a, additionally a cyclic decomposition by copies of every tree. So cyclic, the definition of this is that the decomposition is invariant under some cyclic permutation of the vertices. So these are the two conjectures which the talk will be about. If you haven't seen these conjectures before, the numbers in them might look a bit arbitrary particularly in Ringel's conjecture, why do you have this 2n plus 1? It seems like a fairly arbitrary number into which to decompose um, uh, into trees. So there's two motivations for this number, 2n plus 1. So one motivation is just, so that they both come from the fact that, from counting the number of edges in the complete graph. You have 2n plus 1 choose two edges in the complete graph on this many vertices, which is 2n plus 1 times 2n over 2, the twos cancel, and you see that this number, the number of edges, it's divisible by n. So at least on the level of the number of edges, it's plausible that you can divide the complete graph into copies of the tree. A second question you might have is, why is it 2n plus 1 and not some smaller number? So there are, so say if you have a complete graph on just n plus 1 vertices, you'll still be divisible by the number of edges of the tree. So why don't we take a smaller complete graph? And indeed, for some trees, it's possible to decompose a smaller complete graph into copies of a tree. So for example, Wallachis theorem and all theorem says that you can always decompose a complete graph into Hamiltonian paths. Um, but if you want to decompose into stars, the smallest size of a complete graph for which it's plausible that you can decompose it into uh, stars is 2n plus 1. And the way you see this is that um, if you have less vertices than 2n plus 1, then by counting the number of edges, you can count how many stars you'll need. And if the number of vertices is less than 2n plus 1, you'll see that the number of stars in the decomposition has to be less than the number of vertices in the complete graph. Because of that, there'll be some vertex in the complete graph, which is never the center of the star. And just by counting the number of stars you have, you'll never use up all of the edges through that one vertex. Uh, using just leaves of the other stars. So to summarize this number 2n plus 1, it's the smallest size of a complete graph for which it's plausible that you can always decompose it into every single tree. And that's why the conjecture is what it is. Okay, so for the next two slides, I'll tell you about what's known about this conjecture. So I, I won't go completely chronologically. I'll split the results into kind of two directions from which people have approached it. One is when you don't really care about what kind of decomposition you find into trees, um, 
there have been results like that, and also there have been results which look for specifically for cyclic decompositions. So first about general decompositions, when you don't really um, care about getting the cyclic decomposition. So here, some of the earlier results, so for example, by Ringel, were to prove the conjecture for some specific kinds of trees. So for example, uh, for paths and stars and so on, this was proved. Um, a lot of these early results actually used cyclic decomposition, so I'll, I'll talk about them a bit later. The first quite general result about Ringel's conjecture was by Bircher, Flatke, Piquet, and Taras, who showed that the conjecture holds asymptotically for bounded degree trees. Asymptotic here means that rather than getting a decomposition of all the edges in the cohesive graph, you get a decomposition of most of the edges. And bounded degree means that the, the, the vertices in the tree have degrees bounded by some large constant. Uh, the bounded degree assumption was weakened by independently by Ferb and Samatai and by Adamacic, Alan Grotzo, and Slatki, who show that degree n over log entries, you can also get an asymptotic decomposition. And recently, Yus, Kim, Kuhn, and Ostus proved the conjecture fully for bounded degree trees. And um, Alan, Birch, Clemens, and Taras uh, weakened the bounded degree assumption to n over log n if you additionally assume that you have linearly many leaves in the tree. So this is what's known about uh, decompositions when you don't want them to be cyclic. So let me mention a few things about the proofs of these results. So they all worked by developing some general and quite powerful techniques for decomposing graphs into other graphs. So I've stated here what these papers say about Ringel's conjecture, but all of the papers are actually substantially more general than Ringel's conjecture. Particularly, they don't always talk about decomposition into trees. So some of these results about decomposition into, say, bounded degeneracy graphs or bounded degree graphs or cycles. So they apply to more, 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 more than just trees. And also, um, a lot of these results apply when the, the host graph isn't complete, but is replaced by, say, some pseudorandom graph. So to, op to obtain such powerful results, these orthophilists uh, generally uh, um, come up with some general strategy for, for graph decomposition, usually based on some random decomposition approach where this is a random packing approach where say you start with a complete graph and you randomly pack trees into it one by one and show that you can maintain some kind of pseudorandom conditions in the edges which you haven't used before in this way show that you can pack all or almost all all of the edges of the of the complete graph and for these last two results about exact decomposition this is often combined with a, an absorption approach um, so a lot of powerful techniques were, 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 were developed in, in these papers. They all have one limitation that you needed some kind of bounded degree assumption on the tree. And this seems to be a natural barrier for random packing approaches because imagine you're trying to decompose into a tree which has unbounded degrees, like say a star. And say you've managed to somehow pack 1% uh, of your stars into the complete graphs then necessarily if you've done that the degrees in the remaining edges have to be unbalanced because some vertices will be centers of stars some will not be centers of stars and because of that it seems hard to maintain any kind of simple to the randomness condition okay so this is what's known about general decompositions of complete graphs there's also been some work in uh, looking at cyclic decomposition specifically so here, I'll, 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 I'll tell you, um, it'll be important later in the talk, uh, a lemma of Rosa, which gives an alternative characterization of what it, what it means for a complete graph to have a cyclic decomposition by a tree. Rosa showed that this is equivalent to finding a rainbow copy of a tree in a particular coloring of a complete graph, which is called the near distance coloring. And I'll show this to you because the proofs which I'll talk about later will all take place of, in the setting of a rainbow copy of the tree in a particular coloring of a complete graph. So Rosa showed that finding a cyclic by, by a tree is the same as 
So I'll, I'll sketch to you an example with this tree on four, uh, four edges. So Ringel would have looked at a complete graph on two times n plus one, so nine vertices. And Rosa showed that finding a decomposition of this complete graph by copies of this tree cyclically is the same as finding, um, as studying a particular coloring of the complete graph called the near distance coloring and finding a rainbow copy of the tree there where rainbow means that the tree uses one edge of every color. So what is the near distance coloring? To get the near distance coloring of the complete graph, you arrange the vertices of the complete graph um, on the plane as, a, as, a, as like a regular nine gone here, and you color the edges by their Euclidean length. So for example, the edges on the outside here, they all have the same length because they're the shortest edges. And now if you find the rainbow copy of the tree in this coloring, and if you just take rotations of the tree around the center, this, is, this produces the cyclic decomposition which Kritzik wanted. And the reason this works is because the starting tree is rainbow, so when you rotate it, because rotations are asymmetries, you never rotate an edge to another edge of the, of, of, of the, of the tree. Okay, um, so all the proofs we'll, we'll, we'll look at later will take place in, in the setting of finding a rainbow copy of the tree in the near distance coloring. So what's, what's known about cyclic decomposition? So there's really been a lot of results proving that you can get cyclic decompositions by some very specific trees. So things like cycles, are, oh sorry, that paths are known, um, small trees are known, trees with few leaves, stars, lots of results here. And also there's been one fairly general result by Adam Ashik, Alan Grotcho, and Klaki who showed that by bounded degree trees, you can get approximate cyclic decompositions. Let me mention that all of the results that I talk about here about cyclic decompositions, they weren't directly about cyclic decomposition. Um, they were actually in the setting of something called graceful labeling, uh, where there's a conjecture called the graceful labeling conjecture. I'll mention it at the end of the talk, but the graceful labeling conjecture says is a strengthening of the cyclic decomposition conjecture by Kurtzik. So all of the results here actually prove something a bit stronger than a cyclic decomposition. Okay, so now I'll tell you about the, the results I'll, I'll, I want to talk about for the, uh, that we proved with um, Richard Montgomery and Benny Sudokov. So a couple of years ago, we proved the first theorem here, which says that if you have a coloring of a complete graph called a two-factorization, a two-factorization is a particular color, is a kind of coloring of the complete graph, which is more general than this near-distance coloring. So this theorem is about color complete graphs, which are more general than the near-distance coloring. What we showed is that there you can always find a rainbow copy of every tree which is a little bit smaller than n. Um, so in particular, it shows that inside uh, the near distance coloring, you can find a copy of every, a rainbow copy of every tree, which is a little bit less than n, which gives you approximate cyclic decomposition by every tree. So the interesting thing about this theorem was that it didn't have any kind of bounded degree restriction. So this really applied to all trees. Recently, we thought more specifically on this near distance coloring, and there we were able to prove the theorem without the error term. So there you can find a copy of every rainbow tree with n edges. So what does this imply? So first, using this lemma of Rosa, you get that Ringel's conjecture um, holds for sufficiently large trees. So both of these theorems, well, the second theorem, it should say, and is sufficiently large. Um, so you get that Ringel's conjecture hold for sufficiently large trees. So this was independently proved recently. So the paper appeared on the archive last week by Peter Kivesh and Catherine Steiden. And the methods the two papers use are fairly different. So our proof, because it uses this rainbow approach, it's about cyclic decompositions. It generalizes there. Um, so in particular, it implies this cyclic decomposition conjecture, whereas the proof of Kivesh and Staden, it's about, it, it, takes, it, it talks about general decompositions, um, and because of that, they can 
prove generalizations into other directions. So for example, if you're, if you're not looking just at a complete graph, but you want to decompose a complete graph, uh, just as some kind of pseudo random graph, they can decompose those into copies of every tree as well. Um, okay, so for the rest of the time, I'll tell you what I can about the proofs of these theorems. So I can't give you the full proofs, not so much because they're super technical, but partly because um, there are several cases that you need to prove. So for some, some trees, we find rainable copies of them using one method, and other trees we find rainable copies of them using a different method. And there's just not enough time to explain how all of them work. So instead, how I'll structure the rest of the talk is first, I'll tell you what the different kinds of trees are. So there'll be th every tree will be one of three types, and each, each of them is proved found using a different method. And then I'll try and explain to you, first of all, how we deal with high degree vertices, kind of in this theorem. Um, so what are the ideas for dealing with high degree vertices? And also, what are the ideas for um, getting rid of the error term? OK, so first I'll talk about what the kinds of trees are. So for us, to prove this theorem, every tree is in is, is of one of three types. So every tree is either a path-like tree, or a matching-like tree, or a star-like tree. So first, a path-like tree. This is defined as a tree in which most of the vertices are contained in long bare paths. A bare path in a tree means it's a path in the tree where the vertices have degree two on the tree, so there aren't any are just coming out of the path. So if linearly, so imagine C is just a large constant here. If linearly many of the vertices on the tree are on along bare paths, this is called a path-like tree. So the picture you have is most of the tree, you don't know anything about what happens here, uh, but you have some path coming out of it. That's a path-like tree. A matching-like tree is one where most of the vertices, uh, where some proportion of the vertices are non-neighboring leaves in the tree. So non-neighboring leaves means leaves in the tree where the vertices from which they come from are all distinct. So imagine you have like a matching of leaves. So the picture here is most of the tree, you don't know anything about what it looks like. And then you have a matching coming out of it, of leaves. So that's a matching-like tree. And finally, a star-like tree is a bit different here. 99% of the edges of the tree are on large stars of leaves. So the picture here is that 1% of the tree you don't know anything about, but 99% of it is just big stars ending with leaves. Okay, so those are the three types of trees. To prove that, uh, to show that our, our proof is a proof of the theorem, you need to show that every tree is of one of these three types. Um, and this is done using reasonably standard arguments for classifying trees based on the phenomenon that in every tree, you either have a lot of bare paths or you have a lot of leaves. Okay, so then about the proofs of these, these three cases, so the first two, path-like trees and matching-like trees, pro the proof there is fairly unified. Um, it's a probabilistic proof in that we find a randomized rainbow copy of the tree. And the ideas there are very much inspired by these general techniques for graph decomposition. Although, of course, we, we're, we're not, we don't work in the setting of graph decomposition, but the techniques are inspired by this. For the star-like trees, the arguments are completely different. They're very much deterministic arguments, and they're more closely inspired by these uh, um, a lot of arguments that people were using for graceful labeling and for fighting cyclic decompositions before. Okay. Next, I'll tell you a bit about the proofs of these. To avoid getting too technical, I won't talk about the proofs of these for general trees, but I'll look at one particular tree, which is called an example tree. Um, and just show you the proofs for that particular tree. 
So the example tree is the following one. So for the rest of the talk, we'll just be studying this tree. So the tree is a large star where 99% of the edges of the tree are on this star. And then you have a reasonably long path of length 1% coming out of it. So this should be 0 0.01 and not 0 0.1. Okay, um, so this is the tree we'll be looking at. So if the classification on the previous slide is correct, then this tree has to be either matching-like, path-like, or star-like. Um, can anyone see which one it is? Right in the chat if you can. Anyone? Um, so this tree is star-like, very good, Felix. So this is a star-like tree because 99% um, of the edges are on large stars. So it's a star-like tree, but also, as Nina points out, it's a path-like tree because um, you have a lot of edges or a lot of vertices on, on long bare paths. So actually this, this tree, it satisfies two of the conditions on um, the previous slide, it's both path-like and star-like. So the, the classes of trees, they weren't disjoint from each other. So this will be a good example tree for two reasons. First, because it allows us, it'll allow us to illustrate how two different kinds of trees work, both path-like ones and star-like ones. Um, and secondly, another reason why this is a good example tree is because it has a high degree vertex. And as I mentioned, um, some of the main, one of the main difficulties in proving Ringel's conjecture before was how do you deal with high degree vertices? So as an example, it's good to use a tree which has a high degree vertex. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'll kind of sketch you two um, proofs of how to find a rainbow copy of this tree in the near distance coloring. One when we think of it as a star-like tree and one when we think of it as a path-like tree. So first, star-like. Um, so for the star-like embedding, we'll very heavily use the fact that you're in near distance coloring. In particular, one property which is important for the talk is that in the near distance coloring, if you cut the coloring in half like this, then every color goes upwards from, from any vertex. It also goes downwards, kind of symmetrically like this. So this will be an important property for us. Okay. So to find a copy of the previous tree, we split the vertices into two intervals around the circle. One interval of length two, 0 0.2 n going downwards from some arbitrary vertex, and another interval of length n going upwards from the same vertex. And the path will be embedded into this lower interval, and the star will be embedded into the upper interval. And the key for, for, for the star-like embedding is that first we find the path and then we find the star. So that, that's kind of the, the idea of the proof. So first you start from this arbitrary vertex and you build a path going downwards. So you find a rainbow path going into this interval somehow. This you can do greedily. So you, you kind of greedily build a rainbow path one vertex at a time. And the claim is that you can get a path of length 1% of n this way. And there's plenty of room for that because this interval has length 0.2n. Imagine you've started from this vertex and you've built a rainbow path going into this lower interval. Then because the path has length only 1% of n, you've at most used 1% of the vertices everywhere and 1% of the colors. So um, you can always find a vertex in, in this interval into which you can continue the path using a new vertex and a new color. Okay, so you can build a path of length 1% of n go in, staying in this interval. And then you need to add a star to that path using every single one of the remaining colors. And here we use the property that all the colors go from this vertex into this top interval. So every color goes into it exactly once. So therefore, if you just take the star using the colors which you haven't used before, you'll get a copy of the example tree. So that's, that's, that's a, a, a sketch um, of the, how, how we find the rainbow copy of this tree when we think of it as a star-like tree. 
for general star-like trees, the, the proof becomes a bit more complicated than the one I showed to you here. And, and particularly because more complicated when you have more than one large star in the, in the, in the star-like tree. So if you just have one vertex, which is a large star, then essentially this proof works for any star-like tree. But if you have several large stars, then the main difficulty becomes making sure that the vertices and the colors you use on these large stars are, are disjoint. But, but, but it can be dealt with. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'll sketch you a second proof of finding a rainbow copy of this example tree, this time thinking of it as a path-like tree and not a star-like tree. So in this case, the embedding we find will be a randomized embedding of the tree. What does this mean? This means there'll be some probability distribution over, um, over subgraphs of the near distance coloring. And you show that with high probability, this will give you a rainbow copy of this example tree. So the random embedding will be constructed into, in two steps which will be the opposite of how we worked in the star-like embedding. So here, first you find the star, then you find the path. So in the first step, you find a random star of the right size. So for the rest of the talk, I'll think of the star as having size um, one minus Pn and the path as ha having size Pn. So P is 1%. Uh, so first you find the random star of size 99% of N and then you show that with high probability, you can extend it using a path of the right length, which will use all the remaining colors. So that's the structure of the, the proof for the path-like embedding. What do I mean by find a random star of this size? So probably the most natural interpretation of that is to uniformly at random out of all stars of this size, just pick one. That's not quite what we do because uh, mainly because if you do that, then the distribution of the vertices and the colors which are not used on that star will not be a very nice distribution. And for the second step, in order to make its proof as easy as possible, we want that the colors and the vertices which are available for using on this path in the second step are really nicely distributed. So instead, we use the following to find the random star. So we show that. Um, we should prove the following lemma, which says that inside the near distance coloring, so this all takes place in the near distance coloring, you can find three random objects. One is a random star, a second one is a random vertex set, and the third one is a random set of colors. And these are all disjoint, so this random, these vertices and the colors are not used on the star. And they have three properties. So first of all, the star is about the size that you want. It's about size one minus p times n. And secondly, the vertices and the colors, they're nicely distributed. So every vertex is not used on the star with probability P independently. Every color is not used on the star with probability P independently. So this is, this, this is what we mean by random star. I'll show you the proof of this lemma, it's not hard. The proof, the idea of the proof is to pick the random set of vertices first. So that's, that's, that's what you pick. So let's just, just for simplicity, let's fix the center of a star to be at some specific vertex. Um, but just would you, by symmetry, you can kind of do that. And let's pick every vertex independently with probability P. So you get a set of vertices um, of size about 2PN. So this will be the set of vertices. So it'll have size 2PN by Chernoff's bound. And now let's find the, the star centered at this vertex. And let's look at the edges going from this vertex into the top half of the near distance coloring. As we saw before, every color is present there. So every color goes from this vertex into the top half here. Um, so by Chernoff's bound, about half of this set V will intersect the top half. So you'll only have about P and vertices of V in the top half. So if you delete those uh, neighbors from this center, 
you'll be left with a star of size by Chernus bound one minus Pn. Okay, so this gives you the first two properties. What about the third property, the colors? So what happens with the colors? So here we use the property that every color goes from this vertex into the top half of the near distance coloring. So because every vertex is deleted with probability P, every one of the colors will also be present on the star with probability one minus P and absent from the star with probability P. So you get all three of these properties. So that's a proof of this lemma. So one important remark to make is that although this lemma produces a random set of vertices, which is nicely distributed, and the random set of colors, which is nicely distributed, the joint distribution between the vertices of the colors is not so nice. So the vertices and the colors that you get could depend on each other. In fact, they do depend on each other. Um, and this seems to be a, a necessary difficulty which you need to deal with when dealing with high degree vertices like this. So you get dependencies between the vertices and the colors here and you have to deal with them for the rest of the proof. Um, so that's one remark. The second remark is that this lemma, when we, want to, we, want, when we really want to prove the full theorem, is generalizes to all trees. So this is, if instead of a star here, you just wanted any tree of this size, um, the, then it generalizes to that. Okay. So this is the first step of, of finding a path like copy of the tree. In the second step, we need to find a path which uses all the remaining colors. So this lemma is combined with a path lemma, which gives you um, in the remaining in the remaining vertices and the colors a path which uses all the remaining colors. So the setting here is you have a random set of vertices and colors in the near distance coloring, and you think of these as exactly what was produced by the previous lemma. So every vertex is in this set with probability about P, every color is in the set with probability about P, and the le lemma produces to you a round rainbow path which uses um, exactly the colors that are left over. Um, so just two remarks here. So first, you don't need to choose the vertices here with probability exactly P. You can choose them with a probability a bit less than P. That's because there's room in the vertices um, that you can use. If you go back to this lemma, the number of vertices left over here was two times P times N, whereas the path that you need to find to join to the star has size P times N. So there's actually room in the vertices, which is why you can take a smaller probability here. And secondly, this lemma combines with the previous one to essentially give a rainbow copy of the example tree. So how does that work? Let's check it. So from this previous lemma, it gives you a star and a random set of vertices and colors, which can depend on each other. This lemma takes as an input a random set of vertices and colors, where here they're also allowed to depend on each other arbitrarily, and it produces Apart using all the missing colors. So this nearly gives us the example tree. So there's, there's a couple of reasons why it doesn't quite give it to you. So one is that the star here didn't have exactly the right size that we want. We want it to have size exactly one minus P and this, this is not quite what the lemma gives us. So that's, that's one issue. And the second issue is that um, when you combine the two lemmas as I've stated them, the path is not going to be joined to the star necessarily. Um, but you will still end up using all the colors. So that's kind of some issues which I won't deal with for the rest of the talk to be, but you do need to deal with them. Okay. Another remark is that this random path lemma, it generalizes to bounded degree trees. So in this setting where you have a random set of vertices and random set of colors, which can depend on each other, you can actually find here uh, um, a, a, any bounded degree tree of the right size. Okay, so next I'll talk about how to prove this random path lemma. That's, that's what we need to talk about next. It's proved using the absorption technique. So this is, the absorption technique was, um, I think, introduced first by 
Rodel Ruchinsky and Simredi, and it's a versatile way of taking an approximate proof of something and turning it into exact proof of something. So in this case, we'll start with an approximate version of this random path lemma, which is um, this. So it's exactly what it was before, except rather than getting a rainbow path here, which uses all the colors, you use all but some epsilon and many colors, where epsilon is just some constant less than p. And so this is one ingredient of the absorption approach. And this, I won't talk about how to prove this. This was proved in our kind of earlier theorem about this, um, uh, finding nearly sp spanning rainbow trees in, in, in two factorizations. So then this will be combined with an absorption lemma, which will let you extend the path using the remaining epsilon and colors. Um, so the variant of absorption we'll use is, will be called distributive absorption, which is a, a variant of the absorption technique introduced by Richard Montgomery in his proof of Kant's conjecture about the probability threshold for finding a spanning tree in the Erdős Renyi random graph. So distributive absorption is a variant of the absorption technique, which seems to be quite versatile, and, and this is what we use. Okay, so to prove this version of the path lemma, which get, gives you a path which uses every color. We use the asymptotic version, which gives you a rainbow path in the same setting, which, which uses all but epsilon and colors, together with an absorption lemma. Where here I'll start by say, stating a simplified version of the absorption lemma, which we use, um, which isn't true, but then we'll modify it into something that's true. So in the absorption lemma, the setting is we have a random set of vertices, which are chosen with probability around P, just like before, so every vertex is in the set independently with the same probability. The conclusion is that if you have any set of colors, um, of P and colors, then if you choose any small subset of that, you can find a rainbow path using exactly that subset. So you think of, um, you think of these colors C as the colors you want to absorb. So you have some set of colors which you want to absorb. And for any subset of them, you can get a ray of a path using exactly those colors. Now, these two lemmas together combine to give you um, essentially the version of the path lemma on the previous slide where you use all of the colors on the path. So how does this work? Well, on the previous lemma, you had a random set of vertices and colors where the vertices were chosen with probability 0.9p, the colors were chosen with probability p. If you had a set of vertices chosen with probability 0.9p, you can split this into two disjoint sets of vertices, one with where every vertex is in it with probability 0.8p, and one where every vertex is in it with probability 0.1p. In the first set of vertices, you can find a rainbow path using all but epsilon and colors using this asymptotic version of the path lemma. And in the second set of vertices, you can find a path using the remaining epsilon and vertices um, using this absorption lemma. So now you'll have all of the colors that you want on two paths, one of this length and one of length epsilon n. And again, you have this issue about connecting the two paths together and we won't go into that. Okay, so these two lemmas would combine to, 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 to essentially prove the exact path lemma on the previous slide. Um, unfortunately, this absorption lemma, as I've stated, is too strong to be true, basically because it's, it's, it's asking too much for the, these, these paths to use um, exactly the colors you want and nothing else. So that's why in the actual absorption lemma that we have, which is this, um, you also introduce some extra colors, which will be used on the path that you find um, together with the colors that you want to absorb. So the, red, the two red bits, they're the bits that are different from the simplified absorption that I had. So again, you have a set of P and colors which you want to absorb. So C den denotes the colors you want to absorb. And then you introduce some extra colors. So E stands for extra colors, which will be used on the path that you'll get in the end. Um, but they'll always be there. 
So from the calls you want to absorb, you pick a subset of any subset of epsilon n colors, and then together with all of these extra colors that you find, you get a path which uses all the extra colors and any subset of the colors you want to absorb. So this lemma now is actually true, and it also combines with this asymptotic version of the path lemma to essentially give you um, an embedding of the example tree. There are again some um, some more technicalities that you need to deal with. So for example, where do these extra colors come from? If you're just looking at the example tree, um, they don't really cause problems because these extra colors, uh, does E depend on C? Yes, E depends on C, great question. So for, so uh, the way this absorption lemma works is you have a random set of vertices and then for every set of colors, so C doesn't have to be a random set of colors, it can be any set of colors. For every set of colors, it gives you a set of extra colors that you need, and then together they have this property that you can find a random path inside V. A good question. Um, where was I? Yeah, so these two lemmas still combine to give you an, an embedding of the example tree. Uh, so, so one difficulty is where do these extra colors come from? Because the example tree is just has such a simple structure, there's a path and a star, these extra calls will end up being on the star. And if you, at the start, picked your probabilities and stuff carefully, um, it, you can just delete these leaves from the star and, and, and this will give you the, the, the tree that you want. Okay, so now we'll talk about how to find, how to prove this absorption lemma. To make things simpler, I'll talk about a, a, a weaker version of it, where rather than the, the, the number of colors which you might want to absorb, rather than it having size p times n, it'll have size just two times epsilon n. So we'll just look at a smaller set of colors which you might want to absorb. So here's, 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 here's this lemma. So it's exactly what we had before, except this set is smaller. So this, this is proved using a technique called distributive absorption, which, which as I mentioned is something that Richard Montgomery introduced. And the kind of one sentence summary of what distributive absorption is, it's a way of building large absorbing structures out of small ones. By a large absorbing structure, I mean um, some, something that implies a lemma like this one. So something like this set of colors, E extra colors, which allows you to absorb any subset of epsilon colors out of two epsilon n of them. Um, finding a structure that does this from scratch can be difficult, and Richard introduced a way of building a large structure like this out of very small subgraphs. So that's, that's kind of it as a summary is what distributive absorption is. So to illustrate this to you, I'll first give you a proof of this lemma when epsilon is very, very small. So this lemma is actually true even when epsilon is get, tending to zero. Um, so we'll even just look at the case when epsilon is one over n, then this lemma is still true and then it becomes actually very easy to prove. So what happens when you set epsilon is one over n? So epsilon always appears together with n. So if you set it as one over n, it'll just cancel with n everywhere. And you'll just get that C is a set of two colors. You get these, these, so there's two colors which you might want to absorb. The lemma would give you a set of at most four colors, extra colors, such that for any subset of one color from these two colors, you can find a rainbow path which uses that color plus all the extra colors. And if you play around with the near distance coloring, it's very easy to find structures which behave like this there. So here's an example of one of them. So here, the two colors which I might want to absorb are red and blue, and the two extra colors are these two shades of gray. Uh, so this hexagon or this six cycle ends up behaving like this absorbing structure that you want. Uh, specifically from this vertex and this vert between. Uh, I don't understand your question, Shaknik. Do you take M to E to be empty in this case? Um, so from this vertex to this vertex, there's two paths in this six cycle. One which uses red and the two extra colors, and the other one which uses blue and the two extra colors. 
And those are the two paths that you want for this, this version of absorption. And so you want that for, you want that for every um, subset of this set of two colors, specifically for every one color you pick here, so red or blue, you can get a path which uses that color and both of the extra colors. And you can see that you have this behavior. So you want to show that inside the near distance coloring, you can always find, um, you can always find hexagons which look like this. So that, Oh no, uh, do I draw? No, let's see that. One second. So that's not too hard to do. So imagine this is your near distance coloring, and you want to find uh, a copy of a hexagon which looks like this. So it's it's good to think geometrically here. So this, yes. So these colors all co correspond to lengths in the near distance coloring. So say red maybe corresponds to length one and blue corresponds to length two. And what you want to find in the near distance coloring is a red edge, which has length one, a blue edge, which has length two, like which will look something like this. And then you want to pick two gray edges or two, two, two gray colors, which corresponds to two other lengths and you can pick them to be whatever you want so that you get a six cycle. And this will look something like this. So remember all of the, um, all edges of the same color in the near distance coloring have the same Euclidean length. So this will eventually look something like, we use orange for the other gray color, this. So it will be, uh, uh, a, a six cycle which looks something like this. You, you need that the, the, the lengths of all the edges are the same. So it's not, it's not too hard. It, it comes down to solving some equations to show that you can always find things like this. So in the near distance coloring, you can always find one structure that has six cycles which look like this. That doesn't quite prove the absorption lemma we have stated here because here you want to find these things not just in the near distance coloring but also so, so in this random set of vertices. But this you can get easily because imagine you can just find one six cycle like this by taking rotations of it, you'll find linearly many disjoint six cycles like it. Uh, so if you choose every vertex independently with the same probability, by Chernos down, it will have to catch lots of six cycles like this. Okay, so that's, that gives you a proof of this, this kind of a very simpler version of the absorption lemma. Now how can we prove it when there is more than two colors which you might want to absorb. So let's look at the version of it now when there's four colors. Then it's, if you play around, you can come up with absorption structures which work there. So here's one of them. So here there's four colors I want to absorb. And I want that for any subset of two of them, you can get a rainbow path which uses those two colors and all the extra colors. In this picture I've used, I've denoted all the extra colors by different shades of gray because I don't want you to pay attention to the extra colors. I just want you to pay attention with what happens with these colors which you want to absorb. So for any two colors I choose here, I should be able to find a path from this vertex to this vertex which uses exactly those. So for example, let's pick red and green. Then if you look at this path which starts here, uses red here, and then uses green here, you, 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 you go from the top to the bottom using those two colors. Or you could pick, for example, uh, green and pink. So start from here, use pink first, then use green and so on. Okay, so this structure has the property that you want. And how did we come up with this structure? So you can see that this structure was built out of four of the six cycles we've had before. So you, you, you took this four, six cycle, you put four of them together and you somehow cleverly picked which colors to use in each one. So here we used red and blue, here you used the other two colors, green and pink, here we used pink and red, and here we used green and blue. Um, and you can also build large absorption structures, so you can increase the number of colors. And roughly what distributed absorption is, is it tells you how to combine these six cycles in order to get a big absorption st structure which can absorb epsilon and many colors. 
there's a kind of combinatorial um, problem in, in how do you arrange these six cycles to get, get a big absorption structure. And this is what this distributive absorption technique lets you do. Okay. I think I'll just move on to open problems now. Um, so I think there's a lot of open problems in this area. Um, particularly, there's lots of problems where we, we know we have partial results towards them, which are where we know how to solve them for, so there's lots of problems about trees where we know how to solve them if you impose some bounded degree restriction on the tree. So here's two problems like this. One is called the Gyarfas tree packing conjecture. Uh, this is a, a relative ring, of Ringel's conjecture where you want to decompose the complete graph into trees, but all the trees don't have to be the same like in Ringel's conjecture. So Gyarfas made a conjecture that if you have a family of trees where the ith tree has i vertices in it, then if you, if you count the number of edges you get here, this will be exactly the number of edges of, in a complete graph on n vertices. Uh, so it's here, you can, conjecture. you can actually always split up a complete graph into copies of a tree. So this will be a very interesting to conjecture to, to uh, solve now. So it's not for bounded degree trees, but I use Kim Kuhn and Ostas. It'd be interesting to solve it fully. So here, perhaps the, 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 the recent techniques of Kivesh and Stadner could be more useful because this conjecture doesn't have a rephrasing in rainbow language. Um, so maybe their techniques would be better here. Another conjecture is called the graceful labeling conjecture. So this is a conjecture of not directly about um, decompositions. It says that if you have any tree, you can label its vertices by numbers one up to n, such that if along the edges of the tree you look at the absolute difference of the labels, you will get different numbers along all the edges. So what does this have to do with the talk today? It turns out to be equivalent to, a, to like a stronger version of the cyclic decomposition conjecture. So remember the cyclic decomposition conjecture was, a, showed, was equivalent to the statement that in this near distance coloring, you can find a rainbow copy of every tree using all the color. So this graceful label of conjecture is equivalent to the statement that if you cut the complete graph in half, so if you look at exactly half of the vertices or half plus one of the vertices like this, then if you look at this half, you see every color appears here already on just on this half. And the graceful label of conjecture is equivalent to the statement that you can find a rainbow copy of your tree just using the vertices on this half, the stronger conjecture. And again, about this conjecture, we know um, that it's true for bounded degree trees, but no, we know it's true asymptotically for bounded degree trees. It'd be very interesting to prove, to prove something in general. Okay, I think I will uh, stop here for any questions, if anyone has any. Thank you. Thank you, Alexei. Um, I'll unmute all and let's imitate applause if possible. Okay, uh, and now if you have any questions, could you uh, write in the chat and then I'll unmute you. Anyone? I have a question. Um, Okay. Uh, G. Well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the bipartite version of Ringel's conjecture. Um, there is a bipartite version of Ringel's conjecture. Off the top of my head, I don't remember the statement of it. I think it doesn't have like a rainbow formulation, uh, or at least an obvious one. So I'm not sure that our techniques can directly be applied there. Certainly the techniques of Kivish and Staden, I would expect them to, uh, to imply this bipartite version of Ringel's conjecture. Um, yeah, so I, th I think it should be using at least the techniques from one of the two papers, it should be possible to prove it. Though I don't think uh, either of them impl imply it directly. Great question.
Any more questions? I have a question. How uh, much of this uh, embeddings translate to pseudo-random graphs when your host graph is not complete? Graph? Uh, when your host graph is not complete, are you talking about the rainbow problem or the? Uh, yeah, when um, I was, I'm mainly talking about this um, embeddings of the star-like or path-like. Yeah, let's think. So, hmm. The proof we have written, it's it really takes place in the complete graph. So we'll look at random subgraphs of the complete graph and show that there you can find rainbow copies of trees. I think our techniques do extend towards to pseudo random graphs, um, at least for some pseudo random color graphs, you will find rainbow trees there, but. I mean, colored to the random. Yeah, exactly. Because in some colored to the random graphs, you can find rainbow trees there. But I, off the top of my head, I don't, I don't know what you can prove without this degree restrictions. Um, so even when I was talking about this random path lemma, to be able to find it, to generalize it, you do need a bounded degree restriction of the trees there. So, but it's a, it's a very interesting question of what, what, what rainbow trees you can find in pseudo-random graphs. Good question. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Okay. Igor has a question, one second. Are there any directed graph variants of wrinkled conjecture? Good question. Mm. I haven't seen any. I haven't seen any. I think. Yeah, so it would be interesting. Yeah, I, do, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. Hello? Sorry, I didn't yeah. know I was unmuted. No, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm just curious because I wonder if it's meaningful, like for tournaments, for instance, whether you can find... Uh, yeah, no, I, th I, think it, I think there probably are interesting things you can ask. So there, um, there are results about decomposing uh, tournaments or directed complete graphs into subgraphs like Kelly's conjecture about decomposing a tournament into Hamiltonian cycles. Oh, okay. uh, there are interesting problems about finding um, trees in tournaments. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I'm sure there are things that you can ask for. I'm just not sure what, the, what even the conjecture should be about decomposing it to direct the trees. Mm -hmm. Probably some interesting barriers to, to be able, able to do that, but I don't know what they are. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? Well, oh yeah, so Keith asks, can this technique also give cyclic decomposition to non-trees of some classes? Um, I think so, yeah. So first of all, this lemma of Rosa, it holds for um, all graphs. So this lemma I showed at the start, or is it this one? Um, that it's, it doesn't have to be a tree here to, to get these cyclic decompositions. You just need a, a rainbow graph, which uses all the colors. Um, and certainly for some subgraphs, maybe our techniques can generalize, but they'll be quite limited. So for things like cycles or um, graphs where most of the graph is like a long path, there I think we probably could find rainbow copies of them, but not for any kind of general classes of graphs. Good question. And I think it's, I think it's very interesting to understand what are the rainbow subgraphs you can find here. Any more questions?
Well, if not, I'm going to unmute again everyone and let's try to give another round of applause to Alexei and thank for the talk and all the answers to the questions.